What is anti-Semitism anyway? We, we talk about it. Where does it come from? Why is it so powerful? And by the way, we're seeing some waves of anti-Semitism uh, traversing the world right now. And uh, anti-Semitism has a biblical source point, I think. And there is biblical reasoning that helps us to understand anti-Semitism, but it's a crazy, crazy thing. It really is. And I think that as we've we've kind of said it, but now let's say it a little bit more explicit in that anti-Semitism is the hatred of the Jews that is satanically inspired. Because why? We have an enemy that, again, is seeking to interrupt or try to, to try the best he's, he's failed at it. Uh, has a great record of failing uh, in the sense of thwarting God's uh, messianic plan of redemption, which includes the Jews. And so as soon as we, as soon as God says, I'm choosing this group, Satan now is hating them. And he's, he's hated them from Abraham's day all the way through. We, we don't have time to trace all that all the way through history, church history, all the way up to the modern day. But l- let me ask you this, Gary, because part of the anti-Semitism it presupposes something else and that is something that I, w- we want to discuss here is give a definition, if you will, of replacement theology. And, and because some might say to you, well, Gary, you're, you know, here you're quoting Ezekiel, but don't you know, didn't you know that all the promises, all the unfulfilled promises that you would have to national Israel in the Old Testament are now on the church? So talk about how replacement theology, what it is and how it contributes to anti-Semitism. Well, the church is about uh, two days old, right? or 2,000 years, 1,000 years being a day, and a day a 1,000 years. And, and <clears throat> the 2,000 years of the church age have not been all uh, roses and, and, and fresh fruit and all the all There have been wars. There have been battles. There have been factions. And a lot of them have arisen to challenge what we consider to be the biblical view of the church. Mm-hmm. And we talk about replacement theology. Uh, you're essentially saying something has replaced something else. And Jew hatred runs all the way back to the first century, to the present. And uh, in Europe, in the Middle East, even the Far East, everywhere you could find that Jews have traveled, there was Jew hatred. And the common belief became generated over the years that God once had a covenant with Jews. It's broken. They, they were, they sinned so grievously. He scattered them all over the world. They'll never come back. And he has replaced Judaism and the 12 tribes and the promises made to the 12 tribes. He has transferred those over to the church. And there have been several lines or factions Mm -hmm. of replacement theology that have come down through the various church. And I don't know whether we want to get into the various denominations or— Not necessarily. But but there would lead us down too far off the— It's the the common thought that the, the Jews really had the covenant of God, but they were so disobedient that God had to rip it away— and the new covenant through the Lord Jesus Christ has replaced uh, permanently, per- forever, per- permanently, forever what the Jews had. Yeah. So, so how do you uh, how do you argue against that? You know, I think it's the, one of the things that we I want to recommend here is uh, we have a book in our in our online bookstore called Zionism: The Case for Zionism by by Tommy Ice, Doctor Tommy Ice, and uh, ho- hopefully you'll find that in the description below. But that's a book that I think every Christian should read because, especially now, the, the, we, as we move forward with Israel becoming so central, this war, who, know, who, who knows how long it is, we need to be able to, to discuss intelligently with those around us that are, uh, that again, as it relates to anti Semitism, that it's increasing. The anti Semitism, it seems, uh, has never left if, since World War II and the Holocaust. It's kind of laid dormant, but it's there. It's been there. And now this is. It's it's been this has given an opportunity to make it rise. But I'll read to you a quote from the Zionism book. It says, "We believe that the international church has superseded for all times national Israel as the institution for the administration of divine blessing to the world." And that is uh, Kenneth Gentry, a replacement theologian. And so when when you look 
when you when you think about that phrase, uh, I'll read you another quote by uh, the other side, uh, Doctor uh, Randall Price. He defines it a theological perspective that teaches that the Jews have been rejected by God and are long, no longer God's chosen people. Those who hold to this view disavow any ethnic future for the Jewish people in connection with the biblical covenants, believing that their spiritual destiny is either to perish or become part of the new religion that superseded Judaism, whether Christianity or Islam. So here we have, and, and you say, how do we respond to it? Well, what we recognize is that there's no evidence anywhere in the Bible that the church replaces Israel, that God will not fulfill his literal promises to Israel. But again, the challenge comes to this, Gary, that we believe that, again, the Jews that are there today, God brought them back because they own the land, but they're there in unbelief. It's not because of their righteousness. We Deuteronomy 9, we read that. But they have a future, and they have a future national restoration. Romans 11.25 says that. But it only comes when they put their faith in Jesus. So as long as we maintain that, yeah. they're, they're kind of on hold. God is going to bring them and, and accomplish his purposes. But their national res restoration, which is prophesied, will not happen until they call on Jesus. And the church, by the way, ha has been given uh, a, a particular destiny and a particular way of, uh, of blessing this earth during the last 2,000 years. Uh, so the church has brought a blessing to the world, but I, I want to point out rather quickly, everybody knows something that I'm about to say, and but they don't often mention it. And that something is that the Jews are a superior people sociologically, mathematically, artistically. Einstein, E equals MC squared. George Gershwin, Piano virtuoso. I mean, go down the list. I could. I don't. I don't want to li oh, list all. People can look it up. It's amazing. It's amazing how many Jews are in the arts and sciences. They they are leading it, and in that way, if you really want to take that particular view, they have blessed the earth with wondrous things by proportion. By pro yeah, they they have more Nobel prizes exactly than in all the different discipl disciplines in the fields that you just mentioned. So that tells you that God has blessed them intentionally, Again, right. not because they're righteous, but in order to accomplish his plan to redeem them fully and finally when they trust Jesus. And they will be redeemed. And we read about that, of course, in the book of Revelation, where the, the, the 12 tribes are regathered, re reassembled, mm -hmm. reassigned, if you will, and, and things are going to be made right after years of absolute horror i mean the wars the uh, the miseries the epidemics you know that are rolling down through the years have a point and they have a a blessed ending and we as christians understand that blessing and we preach it <laughs> and that does not include saying that the jews are, have been forever set aside but rather there is coming a day, and that's why we teach Bible prophecy. There's coming a day uh, when the age of the church will come to an end and Israel will rise to guide the world to that place that God promised so many centuries ago. Yeah, I mean, you, you think about uh, the promises in Isaiah 7 or Isaiah 9, yes. that, uh, uh, even in Daniel 2 as it relates to the Messiah, that the increase of his government will have no end. Well, Jesus, Jesus is going to come and rule as a. He's a Jewish man. He's still. He's he's a human still, <laughs> yeah. and uh, he he he's going to come and sit on the throne of his father David because he's he's a, he's a he's a descendant. By the way, I just have to throw this in. Mm -hmm. In uh, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah, he has a tribe. Revelation five five. Yeah, it's it's crystal clear, Gary, that he has a tribe. And he's what? The son of David. Yes. I mean, I mean, yes. And so the throne of his father, David, was a literal throne in Jerusalem. It's David never ruled in heaven. Luke 132. I mean, you have these passages that in order for God to fulfill his promises, see what happens here is it comes back to at the end of the day, those that are a part of the replacement theology. Again, these these are our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We love them. Uh, we just disagree with them on this regard. We think that they're that they're that they're being inconsistent and they're being inconsistent in this one way. 
And that is, again, when we look at the promises and the prophecies, the Messianic prophecies of Jesus' first coming, all of us, including them, they take it very literal. Jesus would be born in Bethlehem or the Messiah, Micah 5.2, etc., literal. But then when it comes, they say, well, those other promises that God made about restoration, the land will always be yours, that, that becomes applied to the church. How? Well, figuratively, spiritually. And there's really no one-to-one correspondence of how they can do that when you have the idea, they say, well, Jesus is ruling from the throne in heaven. Uh, David never ruled in heaven. <laughs> he How ruled true. from Jerusalem. Yeah. And Psalm 2, I will set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Well, Zion's spiritual. Well, Zion is a hill in, 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 the, in the vicinity right there in Jerusalem. And guess whose foot is going to touch down on Mount Zion? Yes. That's going to be a physical event when the Lord returns. And from that point on, things will happen uh, that you can't even imagine. And we're going to be with our Lord, and we're going to be watching him and perhaps even participating in the, the most massive reconstruction of planet Earth you can possibly imagine going into the millennial period. So what can we say except we stand with Israel? 